Okay, let me start. So I'm teaching uh, modular forms with uh, Marussia, which is yet to arrive. And um, modular forms are um, are um, okay. are holomorphic function on the upper half plane which behave well with respect of the action of one group on the alpha and alpha lane. So I've said many words that are not justified, not, not, not explained. So the first lecture is actually about uh, motivating why we study modular forms and giving some background in complex analysis because holomorphic functions are uh, functions that are complex, differentiable, and so on. And uh, if you don't know anything about complex analysis, that will be very hard to follow whatever we're doing after. So I'm doing uh, a one-hour crash course in complex analysis, which is impossible, of course. Meaning, uh, <laughs> Complex analysis, it's a semester-long course. So this is an impossible task. And so I'm setting myself to failure. But we'll try to do, meaning I will not prove anything, of course. Maybe just give some hints here and there. Mostly give you uh, idea and theorem which you can either accept as they are, or you can read the proof in some book. But the important thing is that you know the statement, because if you know the statement, you will be able to understand when we use them. So let me start. So we start with the definition. So a function is a. Uh, do I have all my papers? Did I left them on the other side. Yeah. So a function is complex differentiable on a point on an open set uh, in the, in the complex plane, if and only if you have the similar definition as in the real case, the limit uh, of the as z goes to z0, fz minus fz0 over z minus z0 exists and is finite. And in that case, we denote it by f prime of z0. So this is look, looks innocent enough, meaning it's exactly the same thing as you have in the real numbers. But what comes out, it's a completely different story. So the first thing that you prove usually it's that uh, requiring that a function is uh, complex differentiable in one point is, uh, is equivalent to require that uh, f is totally differentiable in the sense of real analysis when you think about c as r2, but you also have this uh, partial differential equation, which are called the Cauchy-Riemann equation. So the derivative with respect to x of the real part of f, it's equal to the derivative with respect to y, to the imaginary part of f. You can always split a function in its uh, real and imaginary part. And the derivative of the real part with respect to y, it's minus the derivative of v with respect to x. So these are pretty strong relations. So you, this means that when you have the if you build up the matrix, it's not a, any matrix, it's a matrix with some, it can be only some, some particular metric. So it's, it will be a much more rigid uh, situation. So, and also a function is said to be holomorphic in omega if it's completely differentiable at every point. And it's holomorphic in one point if there exists an open neighborhood such that it's, it's holomorphic on all of the neighborhoods. So it cannot be in just one point. For example, oops, the function z goes to z, z bar, it's complex differentiable at z equals 0, but it's not holomorphic because it's the only point where it's complex differentiable. Everywhere else is not because it doesn't satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equation as you can immediately check. Now, one problem with the... Um, with holomorphic function is that, uh, or in general function of a complex variable, is that uh, it's hard to picture them. Meaning, for real, for real function of one variable, you have the graph. 
And now, nowadays, you have so many computer programs that graph you the function for you, so you're going to get uh, a feeling for function very easily. Well, something can be done also in this case. Uh, this picture are, are made with um, Mathematica, which is a fairly good program, even though expensive. <laughs> <laughs> But luckily, my university buys it in bulk, so the department, everybody in the department has it for free. So since I have it, I use it. So the way that they picture this, uh, this the way that they make this graph of a, of, a, um, of a complex function is the following. The, what you're seeing, it's the graph of the absolute value. So you are graphing over the complex plane and the <coughs> this, the z is just the absolute value of f, but the coloring is giving you the argument so, of the complex number, f of z. So you can see how the argument moves, and you can see, so every point is colored with the, the, with the, and the, there is the legend over there, the legend over there. So you can have a feeling in how, how the, the argument change and what's the absolute value. And so I think I have a couple of more pictures here, yeah. So this is another picture. So you see that uh, around z equals zero, you have that the uh, argument changes free time, and that has something to do with the fact that it's z to the third, and it's at zero there. Okay, and this is the exponential. So for the exponential map, you can see uh, the periodicity. So this, uh, I don't have a pointer, but uh, <clears throat> this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis. So you can see that if you fix, it's, it's periodic. <clears throat> so let me, let me use also the blackboard to make it uh, complete. So examples of holomorphic function So the first example that we already seen picture is this polynomial. Every polynomial is always complex, differentiable everywhere in the plane, so that's not a problem. Secondly, we have the exponential function, so exp of z is just the sum. Oops. So it's the usual exponential. And then you have a sine And you can define cosine in the same way. And you also have a rational function. So these are just f of z is equal to the quotient of two polynomials. These are not holomorphic uh, in all of the complex plane, like this one is one example. Here you will have some problem when uh, z goes to 4i. But they are holomorphic in all the points that are not zeros of the denominator. <coughs> OK, so these are the functions. Now, the, the, the most important thing is Cauchy integral theorem, which we will, uh, of course, there is much more to say. I'm just skipping through the parts that I need to, 
to tell you for, for the course. So we have to define uh, compl complex line integrals. So that's the standard definition. You take a, a piecewise continuous curve from an interval into C, you have a function f, and you s assume that the function is defined that on the image of the curve. So the image of the curve is inside omega. And then you define the line integral along gamma of f along gamma just as the integral from a to b. So it's a real line integral. It's a real integral. f gamma of t meaning over gamma prime of t. So that's a standard definition. It, of course, if you have any question, ask it immediately. So <clears throat> we will have to restrict what open set we take inside C more and more. This is the first restriction. We take something that is arcwise connected. So something that you can join every two points with a, a path inside the, the open set. So that's a domain. And then the first theorem is uh, the following, that if you have a continuous function, you're not asking anything, um, then uh, the following are equivalent. F as a primitive, the integral of F along any closed curve in D vanishes. The integral of f of any, over any curve in D depends only on the beginning and end points of the curve. So the last two being equivalent, it's kind of not that difficult. If it's zero, then you take one going in one direction, one the other one. So this is, will be in, used later. So we, we have to restrict the domains more. So, simply connected domain are, um, are not so easy to define precisely, meaning you need to, to know a bit more geometry. So I'm just giving you an idea. The idea, which is the most important one, it's, uh, it's not important how the border looks like. For example, look there, the border is so weird. It's important that there is no hole inside. If there is no hole inside, then it's simply connected. So the one on the left is simply connected, and the one on the right is not simply connected. <coughs> so Cauchy theorem. So the Cauchy theorem says that if you take any holomorphic function defined on a simply connected domain and um, you pick up any piecewise continuous closed curve and you do the integral, you get zero. That's the fundamental theorem. It's not easy at all to prove it. And uh, we will not do it, of course, because it would take a long time. So you have to believe it. And uh, from, uh, from this, what you get it's the Cauchy integral formula. And this one maybe I will prove for you. So what does Cauchy integral formula says? So first of all, we have a piece of notation. We denote by, okay. We denote by UR Z0, the disk, the open disk centered at Z0 in radius R, and by U bar its closure. So we take a, a simply connected domain, an holomorphic function on, on that simply connected domain, and uh, we assume that the, the closed disk is completely contained in the domain for some, uh, for some r. And then we take the border of the domain, and we go around only once counterclockwise. Then for each point of the domain, this formula, you can compute f of g just by computing the integral, the integral on the right side. So the importance here is that, the importance of this theorem is that to know the value of f of z inside the disk, you just have to know what happened on the border of the disk. 
that's the importance of this theorem. So let me give you a sketch of idea of this uh, theorem. How the Cauchy theorem implies this theorem. It's not the not difficult. I will not give the full proof, but just a sketch. So what I'm doing here is uh, Cauchy theorem that we saw in the previous slides implies Cauchy integral formula. So what do we do? So we have our domain. <clears throat> we have our z at 0 here. And since the, the disk, the closed disk is completely contained, and uh, these are domains, so it's open, actually I can find a bigger disk open that is contained. So I can find R bigger than rho such that U R Z zero is that contains U rho closure Z zero and this one is contained in D. Now I define a function. W, <laughs> which is just f of w minus f of z divided by w minus z for w different from z, and f prime of z if w equals z. Now, this function is clearly holomorphic away from z. And uh, we can apply Cauchy theorem. So we apply for GW on u r z zero minus z. So I take uh, here I have z. I take all of it, but taking z out. <coughs> and what do I get? I get. I get that 1 over 2 pi i of the integral of f, an additional uh, variable minus f of z, index c divided by c minus z, this is 0. <coughs> now, what, what does it mean? It means that uh, 1 over 2 pi i, the integral so here I'm integrating on the, on, uh, on the disk, right? On, uh, on, on gamma. On gamma of f of c, c minus z, c is equal to minus uh, to f of z is equal to f of z times 1 over 2 pi i, the integral of 1 over x minus z the x. So I pull this part out, move it to the other, move the other one to the other side. So I have this one equal to that one. 
But now this one you can compute, well you can, it's easy to compute that this one is actually 2 pi i. The integral of, if you integrate along gamma 1 over c minus z dx, dx c. So you're just going once around counterclockwise around the circle. If you do this integral, this is just 2 pi i. And so if it's 2 pi i, then it, they cancel out. So this is just f of z, f of z. Oops, it went down. Yeah, it's back, it's back. And so the Cauchy theorem implies the Cauchy integral formula by a very simple argument. Meaning this is very simple. So of course you can have a generalized version. So you keep, uh, you keep doing this, the same thing. And which means that, which means that you can actually compute the, the Fn means the derivative m times of z, you can always compute it by some integral of f of c divided by c minus z to some higher power. No, sorry, that equal zero at the end shouldn't be there. So it's just fn to the z equal, cancel the zero at the end. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna put the slides, maybe without the mistakes, <laughs> on the web after, so you don't have to copy them down. They will be available to you. So what does it mean? It means that uh, every holomorphic function is arbitrarily often complex differentiable, which is completely different from the real case. In the real variables, you're going to have a function that is differentiable 17 times and no more. Here, if it's differentiable one, it's differentiable forever. So it's a completely different. <clears throat> well, now we come to the exercise. So. Uh, a function homomorphic of all of C is called an entire function. Now, the two exercises are very, meaning, of course, we will go over them, hopefully, with somebody, some of you coming and explain to us, with my help, uh, in the training session. So the first one is a famous theorem of, of Liouville. And the second is the fundamental theorem of algebra. So every bounded entire function is constant. And each non-constant complex polynomial has at least one root in C. So these are the first two. There are many more ex exercises. And of course, you can use freely whatever I claim as a theorem before. <clears throat> OK. Power theory representation. I have, uh, so we want to represent. Uh, our uh, oh no, I don't have to do anything here. <coughs> we want to represent our holomorphic function as a power series. That's the idea. Because we can differentiate infinitely often, so we think that we can do. So <coughs> what we do is we decompose the, this factor 1 over x minus z. So what we do, here you do, you're doing nothing. No, you're just, multi, if you multiply through, this is just an equality because the thing cancel out. And then you are just expanding in geometric series. Now I'm taking a point z that is inside the u row of z zero. So this number here has absolute value smaller than one. And so I can do the geometric series. And I end up with this uh, object. So 1 over c minus z is just that infinite sum over there. So then I, I plug it in. So I plug it in at, at, at the place of 1 over c minus z, I plug it in the infinite sum. Now, now something magic happened. You can actually exchange, meaning that's not actually, that's a theorem as well, meaning you, you have to prove that you can exchange the integral sign and the it's infinite summation sign, but you can, it's possible, it can be done. And so you get uh, that it, this is becoming a power series. 
and the coefficient are just the derivative divided by n factorial computed in, in z at 0. And so this power series representation holds for all z in the interval that we have chosen at the beginning. OK? So it's very, very, every, every holomorphic function in a neighborhood of a, of a point where it's on its domain can be expanded in power series. And so you can use it because it's easier to work with power series than with uh, holomorphic general function that you don't know. Now, <clears throat> holomorphic functions are nice, but they are a little bit uh, not enough. We need more flexibility, so we need singularities. So, but we don't want uh, any type of singularities. We don't want to have uh, infinitely many singularities getting all together very close. So we introduce this notion of isolated singularity. So uh, first of all, the, the UR with a, with a dot on top means that I'm taking out A. So I'm puncturing the disk at A. So it's all the point with such that Z minus I in an absolute value, it's com between 0 and R. And then I say that uh, I pick up an, uh, an holomorphic function. I take A that it's not in omega. <coughs> and uh, with the property that there exists R such that uh, the puncture disk, it's all inside omega. Then A is called an isolated singularity. So I have my function is defined everywhere in a neighborhood of that point, but not in the point. So it is uh, exactly what we think to be an, an isolated singularity. So there is no other singularity in the neighborhood. And then we can classify the singularity. So the first, uh, the first one are the ones that are not really singularity. We can call them the fake sing. They are pretending to be singularity because they want to be cool, but they, they are not. So we can actually take them away. So this means that uh, it's removable if there exists an holomorphic function, f tilde, defined over all omega joined with A, such that F tilde restricted to omega is F. So you're just eliminating the singularity without any problem. You get an holomorphic function everywhere. Instead, A is called uh, a pole. If there exists an integer M greater or equal than 1, such that G of Z, which is just z minus a to the m time f of z as a removable singularity. So which means what? Means that the singularity is sort of not, it's as bad as 1 over z minus i to the m. That's the idea. And the m, the smaller k, the smallest k integer k with that property is called uh, the order of the pole. If k is 1, the, the pole is called simple. And then we have the bad ones, the bad guys. It's called an essential singularity if it's neither removable nor a pole, so if it's a mess. So, Mathematica gives nice picture of this guy. So you have uh, the removable singularity. The first one is sine z over z, sine z over z. Then you have a simple pole, one over z. So, uh, Pay attention uh, at the colors around the pole or around the isolated singularity. You see z equal 1 over z. Here the colors, you can see them only once around the, the, zero, the pole. If you look here, you have two poles. At 0, you have a pole of order 7. And at 1, you have a pole of order 3. And if you count the yellow, let's say, but every color, yellow goes around 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 six and seven times here, and one, two, three times on the other one. So how many times the argument goes around the <coughs> changes in, in the neighborhood of the pole, it tells you, in a way, what the order of the pole is. And then you have the essential singularity. And there, the, the, the colors change forever, meaning you cannot stop them to change. They keep uh, turning all around. And of course, another thing, the idea that you see here you have a sort of a cylinder here and there. There it's bigger, here it's smaller. It gives you the, the idea of how big the singularity is, meaning this is just a, a 
free and this is a seven. Uh, it's, it's, it, they are not real, those, those cylinders are just made there to give you an idea how the function is, how bad is the that pole for that function. <coughs> for example, I, I tried because I, this one I don't remember, it probably was like, uh, you can give the range for the Z, right? So here the range for the Z is probably 100, but if you go to the range of Z for 10,000, then the polar one at some point stops. It doesn't keep going forever. While the one at seven goes up to probably a million. The essential ones, you can go as much as you want. And there is always a big thing that keeps sticking out. OK. So one, um, one important concept uh, related to singularity is the residue. So while I'm talking, I'm going to clean this one in case I need it after. So the residue, what is the residue? Well, you take uh, an allomorphic function with a pole of order k bigger or equal than 1. Then, actually, you, you have to prove this one. This is not easy. You can represent in, in, the, in the puncture disk f of z by a Lorentz series of that type. So you have uh, some negative terms, which starts at minus k, and then all the positive terms, where a n is just, again, the integral of that, uh, of that thing. And um, the coefficient a minus 1 is called the residue. So the coefficient, the first coefficient after 0, after the constant term, is called the residue of the function at the pole. And they play an important role. In, in the next development of the complex function. There is a residue theorem. <clears throat> so, but first we define what's a meromorphic function. So a meromorphic function on an open set is a, is a function that it's uh, holomorphic on omega minus uh, um, a set S which S is discrete in omega. And each S is a pole. So meromorphic functions do not have essential singularity. That's the, the main point. And uh, not only they're all isolated singularity, well, there are but they're also not accumulating on every, uh, anywhere. <clears throat> so that's a technical definition. We define the order as follow. The order of A, uh, it's 0 at a point in where, it's where it's either defined or, or it's a pole. So that it doesn't have to be defined. So if 0, if it's holomorphing and non-vanishing, the order is k if it vanishes at a, and a k is the first non-zero coefficient in the power expansion around f. So the power series starts with z, z minus a to the k, and it's minus k if it's at, as a pole of order k at a. So that's another. Uh, Another exercise that you can do just by using the run series. And it says that if you have a meromorphic function and a point in, in the domain, then the residue of f prime divided by f is just the order of f. Unless f is constantly 0, then it's not defined because you don't have anything on top. Now, this is the famous residue theorem, which tells you a lot. Because it tells you that uh, you can compute integral just by calculating residues. So, um, well, that's another technical definition, meaning the, this theorem also has the as the Cauchy's theorem, but this theorem more, 
It's usually formulated for uh, arbitrary, um, arbitrary curve inside the D. But then you have to introduce what is called the winding number of the curve around the point, and it gets all complicated. So in this way, I cut out all that part that it's more topological, and we don't need to know. And I'm just considering all those curves that actually have winding number equal 1, so there is no problem. So we, we take a <clears throat> the main idea is that the, they cannot go around. So the, this cannot have self-intersection. The, the curve doesn't have self-intersection. So it's simple if, uh, if the only times in which gamma of t1 is equal gamma of t2, it's for either one to be A or B. And so we call contour a piecewise smooth closed simple curve inside D. So if you have a contour, you have the, the plane it's divided in two parts because the contour is just a contour, meaning what you can what you will do. So you have something like this. This is a contour. And so you have an inside, you have an outside. And the inside will be denoted by I gamma. So the theorem says if you have a simply connected domain and gamma contour in D, F homeromorphic function in D with only finitely many isolated singularity in the interior of gamma, then 1 over 2 pi i of the integral of f of z along gamma is just equal to the sum of the residues over the interior point. <clears throat> that theorem uh, we will use uh, uh, a lot, a lot uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes. So, first of all, let me give you some, uh, some uh, idea how to compute residues. So, if the order is bigger or equal than minus one, well, so actually it's just minus one because if not you don't have any residues, then the residue is just the limit. And similarly, it's a limit, uh, it's a limit of the k minus 1 derivative of f of z multiplied by z minus to the k if the order it's, uh, if the, the order of the pole is k. So this one tells you that uh, in a way what, what you're doing, you are computing integral just by computing limits because that's what you need to do to compute the residue, just to compute these limits. And that's another formula, so if it's just a value. With these three formulas, you will need to do some of the exercise that are coming after. And um, <clears throat> another thing that this the residue theorem is used for is that um, sometimes you have a line integral that are very complicated over the reals, and you can actually think of them as a part of a complex line integral that you stop and then you let go in to infinity and you calculate this, the truncated integral by uh, the residue theorem, completing a joining with some other path that you need in the complex plane, and then you let uh, the, the, meaning the, in, the, the stream point go into infinity and then you can compute the line integral that way. If you're interested, we can, I can tell you more in the training session. So this one you will need later from some exercise. Now we are coming to more or less the residue theorem was uh, the last part, the last bit that we needed to, from complex analysis, uh, just as complex analysis. Now we will do some more complex analysis, but uh, mostly for motivating why we will study this, uh, uh, this particular function on the upper half plane why they're important. So we start studying meromorphic functions that are sort of simple, so periodic. So a meromorphic function is periodic with period omega if f of z plus omega is equal to f of z. And uh, you have examples. For example, 
these are not even meromorphic, these are the exponential function, it's periodic with periods 2 pi i and all its multiple. That's easy to cosine. It's, uh, sorry, there shouldn't be the i there. It's, it's just 2 k pi. So without the i, I will take that mistake as well out. While if you take exponential of 2 pi i of z, then the period is just 1 because I'm just rescaling the other one. So these are examples of periodic function. And uh, actually, uh, there are only two types of periodic function. So either f is simply periodic, so the, all the periods are of the form a multiple of one period, integer multiple, or it's doubly periodic. So all the periods are of the form n1 omega 1 plus n2 omega 2, with n1, n2 in z, and omega 1 and omega 2 linearly independent over r. This one uh, is, is a, meaning it's an exercise not even in um, complex analysis. It's just, uh, you just have to, <coughs> to work in how the, the reals and, and this being linearly independent over r, what, what does it mean over for, for these things. It's, it doesn't require much. It's just a simply a simple exercise, but not trivial. It's not, it's not so easy to prove, but you don't need much. So, <clears throat> so we are interested in, um, not in the simply periodic, but in the double periodic <coughs> meromorphic function. Those functions are called elliptic function. And as you have, I just wrote in the exercise, the, the periods form a lattice. You have two linearly independent periods, and then you can have, you have the subgroup generated by these two over, the, over Z. So these are uh, an example of lattices in the complex plane. So for example, this one is uh, the standard lattice. These are just the, <coughs> the algebraic integer in qi, so this is i, this is 1, so you just get all the, this one is called the hexagonal lattices, lattice, and that's just uh, one random lattice that I just made to make it something different that doesn't look so precise. So, <clears throat> So we want to study this, uh, this, um, this function, this elliptic function. Of course, in a sense, it's enough to study them uh, on, uh, not on all of C, because they keep repeating themselves. So you just have to find uh, a set in C that represents all the other points, and then you study the function in that, in that set. So that set is what is called a fundamental parallelogram. And uh, it's defined, uh, the, the most general way is uh, you take uh, omega 1 and omega 2, two generators of the lattice, and you pick any C, any small complex number C, and you take the sum x1 omega 1 plus x2 omega 2 plus C, where x1 and x2 are between 0 and 1. This is called a fundamental parallelogram, and it's easy to prove, and it's another exercise, that if you have two u1 and u2 inside the fundamental parallelogram, then they are not congruent modulo lambda, so they cannot differ by an element of the lattice. And every u in C is congruent to one element, and only one, in the, in the um, fundamental parallelogram. So these are examples for the hexagonal lattice of fundamental parallelogram. You have many, of course. So this, this three, this one, this one, and that one are all starting meaning they're all, the C would be zero, instead this one, C is not zero, in fact you have a point inside and not on the border, but they're all fundamental parallelograms. So to study your meromorphic function on all of C, it's enough to study it on one of these, because after that it just repeats. Now, <coughs> if, you, if you think about it, what are you doing here? 
if we are, let me. So you, you have, let, let's go back to the fundamental. So what are you doing here? You are saying that uh, more or less, if you would draw the line here and the line here, you would say that this line has to coincide with this line and this line has to coincide with this line. So if you have a piece of paper, it would be like uh, first you close it this way, and then if the piece of paper would be gentle enough, meaning flexible enough, you would close it this way. But what happens, what, what comes out is that that's what it looks like when you take the, what is called the quotient that you will see shortly in uh, one of the courses what means to take the quotient. It means to take uh, one element for each equivalence classes of the, of the group action, meaning when, when we are doing here, it's, we are taking, uh, we are letting, uh, no, it's better even here. So we let lambda uh, act on, by translation on, uh, on C, and what you are, it's, uh, then it's an action. You have a, what is called, uh, two elements are equivalent if they can be moved one to the other one. In, um, by elements of lambda, and this one is telling you that if you want to find a, a set of elements that it's uh, representing all the possible uh, classes modulo lambda, you just have to look for this fundamental parallelogram. And so the fun when you look at geometrically, it is this torus as a real surface. Now, this one we will not need anyway in the future. It's just that it's the geometric object behind it. Okay. So let me give you another exercise. Uh, you take, uh, meaning the first thing is that if you have a, an elliptic function, must have, must have at least one pole. That's also very simple if you think about Liouville's theorem. And if you take uh, two functions which have the same order, at every element of a, in a fundamental parallelogram, then the quotient is constant. But you just use the one above. That's not difficult. And this one are, are more difficult, let's say. If you take an elliptic function with period lattice lambda, then the sum of all the residues is zero. If you sum over all the elements in a fundamental parallelogram, the sum of all the order is zero. And the sum of ord A of F times A, it's congruent to zero modulo lambda. And as a consequence, you get that an elliptic function cannot have only a simple pole in fundamental domain. To do this exercise, you have to use the residue theorem, and you will need that fact. That if, you have, um, if you have a function such that F of A is equal to F of B, and f and f prime do not vanish on the line joining a and b, then the integral, one of two pi i, a over b, f prime, z over f, z, 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 it's actually an integer. Okay. So now the point is, uh, do they exist, this elliptic function? So if I, if I am given a lattice, do I find the uh, elliptic function? Because it can very well be that the set is empty, meaning I'm just uh, imposing a lot of condition. I want the function is meromorphic, I want that it's periodic. Actually, they do exist. Uh, the first one, well, of course here you need probably some more complex nice. You have to know what converges normally we can discuss that also in the, in the training session, what uh, normal convergence is. The point is that this is how it, it works. And if you define this, via, this P function, the, the Weierstrass P function as this infinite sum, it converges everywhere. And you get a function that it's uh, by construction, clearly an elliptic function, and it belongs to the, um, lambda, which is the <clears throat> the field of elliptic function with respect to lambda. What's the, 
And also its derivative, that has that, that form, is another elliptic function with, with respect to lambda. And actually, you can prove that's an exercise that it's a bit more complicated. You can prove that every other function that is in the is a meromorphic function with period lattice lambda is actually just a, a rational function in P in, in P of Z plus P prime of Z times another rational function of P of Z. This one you have to do it uh, uh, the idea of doing this is just uh, if you're given your function you take the pole and the the pole and the, and, the, and the zeros, and then you, 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 cook up, you, know, you cook up an interpolation of P W, and you, well, it's, it's better. OK, we'll discuss this one for sure. This one, I'll discuss, I'll discuss this one for you in the, in the exercise session. It's a bit uh, long to, to prove it by yourself. If you want to try, try. And if you succeed, very well. So now we would like to, <clears throat> I would like to end this one uh, connecting, uh, I have two minutes, connecting uh, uh, this uh, torus that we saw with what is called an elliptic curve. And, and and so also the elliptic function are more justified. So we consider the, the um, Eisenstein series, G and lambda. It, it's just that series. And they give the Lorentz series for both the p vias and p prime. Because one can prove that uh, the Lorentz series uh, has, this has this expansion around 0. And once, and that's it's very simple. Once you have that, you can easily find that uh, the, there is an algebraic differential equation for the p, the p lambda, which says that, oops, p lambda prime square. I forgot the square there. It's equal to 4 p lambda z cubed minus g2 lambda p, of p lambda z minus g3 lambda. So, that's very simple once you have this, uh, sorry. Once you have this expansion, because what you do, <clears throat> you just compute on once, you just compute uh, the Lorentz expansion of, of this one cube. So first you do the square, then you do the cube. And, uh, and then you compute the Lorentz the expansion of uh, the other part of p prime square and the other two. And then when you match them, you see that all the coefficient of the negative powers match and they cancel out. So you get something that is holomorphic at 0. And it's 0 at 0. And so since he has no other singularity, this function, if you take, uh, so the equation is this one. The idea is this one. You take f of z equal p prime square minus 4 p lambda z cube plus g2 lambda p lambda z minus g3 lambda. So you take this function, and then you notice that this function, it's uh, holomorphic everywhere on C minus lambda, because it's, uh, this function are, have only poles at lambda. And then you compute that f of 0 is equal to 0 by looking at the Lorentz expansion. And once you have that f of 0 is equal to 0, then even the point of the lattice have no singularity. So the function for, for, an exercise, for a previous exercise has to be constant. And the constant is 0, because of 0, the value is 0. And so you get uh, the, the, the equation that you need. So which, as a, just an inspiration on the last slide, 
you can take this, um, this map. You take C modulo lambda, so you are thinking about, think about C modulo lambda just as the fundamental parallelogram. You map every point into P2 of C just by mapping in the value of the P values of the P function, the values of the P prime, of the derivative of the P function, and one. And then by that, the theorem just that we just saw, this curve as a, is a cubic curve of that type, and these are the famous elliptic curves, which are very much studied. And so that torus and these elliptic curves are connected, and uh, study modular function in a, in a way we will see next class. It's studying uh, uh, how these elliptic curves can vary, meaning what's the, what's the, what is called the moduli space of an uh, elliptic curve, meaning a parameter space for all the possible elliptic curves. And that's what, why we study modular function, because they are function on this parameter space, which I will introduce next time, of uh, lattices, uh, which in turn is this is the space of parameters for the elliptic curves. I think I'm over for four minutes. I um, apologize.